This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. How'd you pull up from our big old live show in now Melbourne, the most livable city in the world? I was really tired when I got home. I actually went to a gig the next day, but it went from like 12.30 until 6.30 or, or something. I should have just mm. gone in the afternoon. I got there at 12.30 and I was so tired that I just went and had a little sleepy in my car while some of the bands played. <laughs> <laughs> a little nap. And then went back. <laughs> People walking fast. Man, the housing crisis is really, really yeah, starting yeah. to bite. <laughs> Even green stuff is sleeping in their cars. I know, yeah. Well, they spend all their money on European holidays. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I caught up my... Beautiful mother, Judy Ballard, the day after the show. She said, how was your weekend? I said, good. Yeah, we had this big, like, sold out live show for our 100th episode of the podcast. <laughs> My mum said, oh, yeah. What's it called again? Slightly Dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's what we should have done. Slightly Dangerous. Does she not listen, Tom? They're quite supportive parents for most stuff I do, but Just not the this? world of podcasting. Do they not like me personally? I think they hate women. Oh. Um, and so the fact that I'm doing it with you, they'll be like, Ugh. Ooh, Ugh. not her. Oh, she'll have that whiny voice. She's probably got vocal fry. <laughs> She's a woman. <laughs> Love you, mummy. If you want the doll for life, free marijuana, vote Greens. We have a political party in Australia that is openly hostile to the Jewish community, but frankly, openly hostile to most decent Australians. I've always thought the Greens were slightly dangerous to Australia. Slightly dangerous to Australia. Well, for Tom's mum and anyone else who doesn't know, this is Serious Danger, a podcast about green politics in Australia, and it's not an official Greens party podcast. It's made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. We're on to the 101st episode. Can you believe it? Can't believe it. Um, to celebrate, we're doing some fun stuff, like <laughs> um, talking about indefinite detention and refugees and last-minute fast-track laws to demonise them even further. And then you have some some political analysis you'd like to share. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, well, we all love the Australian here at Serious Danger. Here at mm. Slightly Dangerous, we love the Australian, and I found <laughs> another incredible piece of political analysis about the political party, the Greens, that you and I Greens have some political party. connection to, or some mm. investment to, the Greens political party. Mm. We were going to get to it at the live show. We didn't get to. I think it's good enough to hold over and share with okay. you this week. A little bit out of date, but, you know, forgive us. Forgive us, dear listener. I'm also quite hungover because I went to see A Christmas Carol last night. I got quite drunk. so. Um, oh, okay. So I really phoned it in. <laughs> All right. Great. Yeah, so you decided I'll just read this shitty article. People love that, you know. I was doing meticulous research on high court decisions and Tom was like, mm, sleepy. <laughs> we have some new patrons-ish because, okay, so new patrons, according to the data that is available to us, dear listener, Tom, Jonathan, Rachel, Sean, Nick Ibis or Nickabus, who can say, Andrew, Rachel, Patrick, Victoria, Dr. Jeff, Andrew, Scott, mm. Nick, Keith, Matt, Jordan, Ella, Lachlan, Matilda, and definitely Jeff. Not a doctor, I guess. And, but this is what makes me confused because M for Marin, which is my mum, who it does actually listen to the podcast and knows the name <laughs> of it, but I thought was already a patron. So if she unsubscribed and resubscribed, I have some questions when I see her tomorrow. It seems to be happening a lot, but our number of patrons is increasing. So we Okay, so, so some of these at least happening. must be new. So thank you. Whether you're new or you decided to keep supporting us, they're both good and we love you. Or you, maybe you're paying twice, in which case we'll uh, we'll take it. Yeah, um, don't check. You get bonus content for just three bucks a month. That's the lowest you can pay. You can pay more than that if you like. That mm -hmm. just helps us support the show. This week we released a section from the live show uh, that did not go out in the free episode, which was our profile of the incredible Victorian Senator from the United Australia Party, Ralph Babbitt, I his history, this. his views, his thoughts, his feelings. Um, <laughs> really enjoyed doing that. And so if you sign up to the patron, you can take a listen to that and learn about one of our fantastic federal politicians. True. It's true. Also want to say a big shout out to Riley, who's very kindly helped us out before by putting up serious danger posters around the place. He had some left over, I think, and he yeah. sent us an email. Uh, Friendly Geordies was touring his part of the world. And so 
up next to every friendly Geordie's poster, he put a serious danger one. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, give the show a five star review. Subscribe if you, particularly on YouTube, right? Uh, if you don't already subscribe, hello YouTube people, we love you. If oh, you yeah. give us a thumbs up, that also helps more people check out the show and helps the algorithm. So you can do that. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thumbs up and then the subscribe pointing. Click, hit that subscribe button. Hit hit notifications. They say that as well. Like hit notifications. You get notified as soon as the video is out. I don't know if anyone actually does that, but you can at least subscribe. Oh, um, you can also buy merch if you haven't already got a shirt. We had a lovely long line of people at the live show to get some some shirts, and we're almost sold out. By the time that this episode goes out, who knows? We may have none or a few shirts left, but you can go check seriousdangerpod.com has the link to the shop. And as of the time of recording on Friday, we've only got small, extra small and extra, extra large sizes. So if you want to get one for yourself or for someone for Christmas, who knows, uh, go grab she one. She got one for my mum. They're all gone. Get one for your mum, <laughs> yeah, so she doesn't fucking forget. When she looks in the mirror, then she'll know what the name of the goddamn show is. Uh, there are also Clive Palmer stickers as well. Mm. If you want free marijuana and the doll for life, oh, greens, um, that's available there, $3 each. And to people who put in orders, I put in, put out most of the orders. I'll get to the last ones today too. So sorry, they take a little bit longer, but they will get to you, I promise. Mm, it's Tom's fault. Hey. And yet here we find ourselves after opposition leader Peter Dutton has confected an emergency, just as former Prime Minister John Howard did when the Tampa hove over the horizon more than two decades ago, cheer-led on by the Murdoch media, just as they did when the MV Tampa hove over the horizon more than 20 years ago. And the Labor Party has capitulated in the most abject and craven fashion, just as they did when the MV Tampa hove over the horizon 20 years ago. Because if there's one thing that the major parties in this place can agree on, is when you need to demonise someone in this country, demonise refugees. There is a bipartisan lockstep of cruelty to refugees that has run through this country for too long and it needs to end. All right. Well, our first story this week is about this High Court decision that happened a few weeks ago around indefinite detention in immigration detention centres, the fallout from that and then the government's response. Because I feel like this has been unfolding over the last, you know, month or so, or a little bit less, but we haven't really had the space to cover it given there, you know, has been a literal war happening in, in Gaza and an att attempted genocide by Israel on Palestinian people. Yeah. Uh, and we have the live show, do really fit in, fit in there, but there are a few other developments this week that I think are worth, you know, running through as an example of just classic labor behavior and just the lengths that we'll go to, to demonize uh, refugees for, you know, political win and just immediately fold i mean yeah i'm sure we'll get to it yeah but it's fuck it's also early 2000s redux it's yes. war on terror just we're living through it again and labor has learned absolutely nothing from the past mm. and their immediate reaction to any pressure whatsoever when it comes to law and order safety yeah. concerns is to immediately try and outright wing the fucking conservative assholes boo yeah literally peter dutton writing their their laws for them so the, the the initial High Court decision, do you remember seeing this decision come in, Tom, and kind of being like, oh, this seems big? Yeah, I remember this sort of doing the rounds, particularly, yeah, the refugee advocacy space. And I did, for, for, for when I did my, my show of, of refugee stuff, I do remember this particular case, the precedent uh, that was overturning, that was a pretty wild one, which basically said, the High Court said, yep, you can indefinitely detain people forever yeah even if there's no prospect of them being returned anywhere that was yeah. the law for about 20 years right just keep them locked up no sentence nothing like that that's right so that was like 20 years ago ish there was that that was the case of al kateb um that authorized indefinite detention of non-citizens without a valid visa even where deportation was impossible so until uh, this High Court challenge was brought by the Human Rights Law Centre for this stateless Rohingya man who was convicted in Australia and served a, a, a criminal sentence for raping a 10-year-old child. So quite a, a, a fucked up offence, but has served his time mm. in prison and then subsequently failed the, the character test and is unable has been unable to be resettled in a bunch of different states. They've apparently tried six different countries um, and all 
rejected him effectively uh, apart from the US. And there's an interesting question around, yeah, like they hadn't got a definite rejection from the US, but the high court still ruled there was no prospect, no reasonable prospect that he would be repatriated in the foreseeable future. And because of that, the High Court ruled that it was illegal to continue holding him in indefinite detention with no real prospect of repatriation. They ruled that he should be released immediately. They basically were saying that keeping him in indefinite detention in those circumstances breaches the separation of powers because it's punitive for the executive, the government, to be holding him in that way when it's not a decision of a court of the judiciary. Right. Yeah. Yes. So the significance of this case which is, is why, yeah, which is what everyone in the refugee rights sector has been screaming for decades yes, and decades. That exactly. Yes, this is punishment. You are actually torturing and being very cruel to people by being them locked up, uh, keeping them locked up indefinitely. Yes. Yeah. Which is obviously the point of bringing this case, right? As to, mm. to then be a precedent that would have flow on effects for the many other people who are being held indefinitely in immigration detention, which it did. Uh, he, I think within a few hours, this particular person was released from detention. And then within a few days, the government had confirmed that 84 other asylum seekers had been released. These were people who had failed that quote, character test that had been applied Mm. to them when they were seeking a visa um, or they'd had adverse security findings made against them. And this group of people, so they're not all refugees, but I think it seems like the majority of them are. It's kind of unclear, but a lot of them are refugees who can't go back to their home country because they have a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, they, They include stateless people. They include other intractable cases like the where they can't identify the, the detainee reasonably, or they can't get cooperation from their home country. Um, so these people were all, were all released within a few days mm. of this high court decision, and they were placed on these special bridging visas, a special category R bridging visas that had strict conditions like having to regularly report back to the government and Labor was saying- Like sometimes every day, right? Yeah. Like literally every day you had yeah. to report back- yeah, so they had very what is strict. effectively a parole officer, yeah. Yeah, very strict yeah. conditions on the visas. And, and that was Labor saying, yes, we're releasing these people, um, but there's, you know, these measures in place for quote unquote community safety. Um, but Labor from the start was like, if we, they were saying, if we could keep them in detention, we would. Like, we want, we don't want to release them, but we, the High Court has forced our hand. But they were saying that we don't really know what to do or we don't know how to approach this until we see the High Court's full decision, which won't be released until probably early next year. Of course, as the LNP pointed out, though, the usual consequence for breaching conditions like those reporting conditions would be that they would go back to immigration detention. But the High Court has just said that they they can't be held in immigration detention. So that there was like a bit of a, a loophole there where, where those conditions weren't really enforceable in a way. At this point, like as of this week, I think they're saying now that there's 93 people who have been released, but there are like 250-ish other people who are still in detention who might need to be released under this decision, but it's unclear until we get the full decision from the High Court. Right. Yeah. Just just to back up, Mm. just the case of this particular man. Yeah. Do we know if he came to Australia by boat? I actually don't. Don't know. I actually don't. I do know like, you know, (laughs) It's hard because you never you never want to excuse a crime like <laughs> raping a child. That's really, no. but it's like you the the background for this man. He, you know, he grew up in um, in Myanmar. Was brutally uh, kind of you know persecuted as a Rohingya man. Um, he experienced child abuse himself. He experienced forced labor. His brother was abducted likely unlawfully detained, arbitrarily detained and killed in Myanmar. Mm. His family, because they were Muslim, um, their land was taken from them. Their home was destroyed. They had limited access to education, to healthcare. Uh, So obviously, as with any, pretty much any instance where someone commits an offence like that, particularly when they're young and they don't actually know when he committed that offence how old he was, it was basically accepted when he faced trial that he was 19, but there was a possibility that he was still a minor. Um, they just kind of accepted that he was 19. But it's like, yeah, there's the the reason probably that he got to that point is because he was incredibly fucked up by um, an oppressive regime, a discriminatory regime, regime, and that's why he was, you know, he fled and was unable to return uh, and is now stateless because no one would accept him. I see. So did yeah. he commit that offence 
when he in, got when he got to Australia. Miami? No, when he got, when to, he Australia. got to Australia. He commi- yeah, he committed this on Australian so- yeah. soil. Okay, yeah. he committed that offence, a horrific offence. We we can all agree. Yeah, he serves his time. Yes, for that for that offence. Anyone else who serves who would yeah be charged with an offence like that, an Australian citizen charged with that offence, serve their time. They get out. They yes. might spend time on parole, and then they've served their sentence and they're done. Yes, right. That's the fucking criminal justice system. Yeah. And even if they've committed horrible things, when they get out, they're still considered a human being with yeah. rights who receives things like uh, Medicare and like a social safety net mm. as well. I believe this is another part of the insane outrage about the release of these people. Like there was mm. a story literally like, you know, um, released criminals get welfare, Centrelink or whatever, and people yeah. losing their minds over this yeah. stuff. He's like, yeah, because they need to eat and survive yeah. and we are – and we like to pretend that we're a civilization, so well, that's kind of part of the deal. And not even just on like a, you know, a, a humanitarian, like a compassionate basis, but also if they don't have access to those basic necessities, it is far more likely that they will actually <laughs> offend, that they will be a yes. threat to community safety. Whereas if they have what they need, it's much less likely that they would be. Right. Um so anyway, yeah, I mean, I guess it sounds like you saw some of the kind of campaigning immediately as soon as this decision comes out, as soon as people start to be released, of course, the Murdoch media and the LNP lose their minds and seize the opportunity to say that Labor is, you know, putting community safety at risk, um, basically branding all, all 84 of these people who've been released as murders, murderers and rapists, even though it was, I, don't, I think, so three of the people who were released, the government had confirmed had murder charges and others they didn't to define a number, but a few others were sex offenders. But it's like not all of them even have criminal convictions. But anyway. Right. So, so some of them haven't even been charged or haven't yeah. been found guilty, right? Some of them have It could have be another reason them, that they have but- an objection to a character test. Yeah, the minister, like, it, yeah, it's not necessarily a criminal conviction. Did I see somewhere that someone had like traffic offenses or something as well? Potentially. I thought, like, that that could came be. up at some point. I, maybe yeah. it's not. I, don't I didn't see that. But, that. but yeah. I mean, yeah, it's also perhaps important to underline a negative character assessment is sometimes ASIO saying, hey, this guy's from Sri Lanka and his yes. brother has some association with the yes, Tamil Tigers. Yeah. Therefore, this has a negative character assessment. ASIO does not need to release their reasoning for that negative mm. character assessment and it just stays there forever and will never go away mm. and you have no ability to appeal that or overturn that. Like yeah, it's, potentially it's the reason system. that they left and sought asylum in Australia could be the reason that they then they get a negative character assessment. Um, yes. But, yeah, so, okay, so this happens. So that High Court decision was on the 8th of November. Uh, within a few days, people start getting released. Then by Wednesday the following week, um, Peter Dutton is demanding that all of the released asylum seekers are locked up, put back in detention. By that very night, in response to a question time question, I believe, Labor confirmed they were preparing a bill to do so. And then I, it looks like overnight they released some details of the bill to media at 7.15 a.m. apparently on the Thursday, Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill held a snap press conference where she announced this bill and took no questions and then just bailed. The bill that she announced would give the minister discretion to impose um, new conditions on these kinds of bridging visas like curfews and GPS trackers with prison sentences for breaching those visa conditions. The, and even at that time, so leader of the House, Tony Burke, was on ABC radio saying that the conditions would mean the government would be able to, quote, have control over where these individuals live, where they work, and who they associate with. So that's how they were selling Jeez. this bill. And they clearly have the intention to push it through quickly so that they can immediately apply these conditions and potentially lock people up for breaches. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. They start, so the Liberals are like, look, maybe we will support this, but we have a bunch of other, it's not far, it doesn't go far enough. It's not tough enough. They proposed a bunch of amendments. It took them literally less than five hours to agree to six amendments from the LNP and the Liberals had confirmed by about midday that they would help pass the bill. It passed on Thursday night. It was supported by, you know, the One Nation, Lambie Network, et cetera, and David Mm. Pocock. I don't know if you Great. saw this. Yeah, David Pocock fucking supported it. I'm pretty sure Sophie Scamps and Allegra Spender as well, the Teal Independence, supported this bill. Ultimately, what the bill, the conditions that the bill means can be imposed upon these bridging visa holders are a home, a curfew where they have to stay at home between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., so an eight-hour curfew. Uh, they have to tell the government the names of who they live with. They have to give the government notice before they go 
interstate or overseas. They have to get approval from the immigration minister before they do any work that might bring them into contact with young people or vulnerable people. They have to reveal any contact with people engaged in criminal activities. They have to notify the government if they receive or transfer transfer more than $10,000 in 30 days or if they're declared bankrupt or if they're experiencing, quote, significant financial hardship. Like <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like I don't know how the fuck that helps keep the community safe. Like yeah, you have to tell us right. if you're struggling financially. And if you don't, we'll lock you up. If you have too much money or not enough money, you're too much you're money or not mate. enough money. You're nicked. Yeah, yeah. Like remembering that the campaign for this is, oh, these are murderers and rapists and they're gonna go murder and rape people. What the fuck does that have to do with that? Nothing. Um, but the kicker is the most significant, so the significant amendments that of the LMPs that the government agreed to included making the GPS trackers and the curfews mandatory, that there will be a mandatory blanket conditions on all of these kinds of visas. On all of the, on all the people being released regardless yeah. of their own personal conditions. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Great. And most significantly, mandatory minimum sentences for breach of any of those conditions. So if you are experiencing financial hardship and you don't tell the government, you are liable to a minimum sentence of five years in prison. Are you fucking serious? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. These cunts. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad politics changed. God, it's, it's good. so good we got rid of Scott Morrison, so isn't good. it? Some so good. Some humanity good. in there. Yeah. We got the good yeah. guys. That's right. The, the, the party that's on our side. Nobody our held side. back. Nobody left behind. But you will be locked up no for five years behind. because you're foreign and we don't trust you and we refuse to take on the racist hard right in this country. And we'll we actually fold cowards. immediately because we have no spines whatsoever. Exactly. But we're on your side. On your side. And as a few people, including the Greens, were quick to point out, Labor's own policy platform opposes mandatory minimum sentencing. I will note, like, I was confused initially and maybe other people were. There was an email that came out from the Greens that said that Labor had acted in contradiction with their platform, which opposes mandatory detention. But I think that was a slip up. It's meant to be mandatory sentencing, which it it does. Labor's platform literally says, quote, Labor opposes mandatory sentencing. It read, in substituting the decisions of politicians for those of judges, Mandatory sentencing undermines the independence of the judiciary. It leads to unjust outcomes and it's often discriminatory in practice. Mandatory sentencing does not reduce crime and leads to perverse consequences that undermine community safety, such as by making it more difficult to successfully prosecute criminals. So there you go. Thanks, Labor. I've just, I've just reminded of my uh, podcast interview with Van Batter from a few years ago in which she was celebrating the Labor policy platform in 2019. It's like, oh, mm. if people just read the platform, they would have voted more for Labor. Like, right. Labor doesn't read the fucking Labor platform. Yeah, what are you talking about? Fuck. Uh, <laughs> even, yeah, so former Labor senator, kind of heavyweight Kim Carr came out and heavily criticised this decision to introduce mandatory sentencing in contravention of the party's platform. Nick McKim was saying, you know, courts need to decide punishments, not politicians. Quote, anything less is a step towards tyranny. And I I do think there's an interesting question around mandatory sentencing because obviously the Greens also oppose mandatory sentencing, but it's not uncommon. Like there are mandatory sentences for a range of offences. I can think of particularly in in Queensland, they've introduced quite a few over recent years, including for children. And I often wonder if it's one where there's a gap between public perception um, or public expectations and kind of what the experts will say. Like I think I suspect that ordinary members of the public wouldn't have any issue on the face of it with mandatory minimum sentencing. Do you agree? Yeah, that's probably fair, Um, but that's true of lots of things, particularly when it comes to law and order issues, right, that that I think it's vital that the left and the Greens um, are able to try and take on that bullshit, you know, drugs, drugs being the obvious other example too of like maybe a man on the street has some pretty strong feelings about how the law should treat drug use or their, their inter- if they don't use recreational drugs themselves, the way mm. that they perceive the presence of drugs in society and the way that that should be punished and, and the logic being, you know, punish this harshly and that will discourage the use of drugs presented with the actual evidence of the fact that the war on drugs has been an uh, absolute failure, maybe they'd change their mind. Maybe, yeah. I remember reading an article years ago about how members of the public were taken through a, a, a program where they were giving all the mitigating factors that a judge might take on when factoring in 
delivering a sentence mm. and overwhelmingly the members of those public gave more lenient sentences than the judges did yeah. in those cases too once they'd been given all that information yeah. and actually looked at the person the offender's life and the mitigating circumstances mm. yeah um but of course yes the mainstream media jumps and all that, that and just picture. goes lock them up fuck these cunts they're brown i mean yeah. i mean what is what is so galling to this for me is like they they're criminals while being foreign as well. Like it's just clear, yeah. uncut xenophobia. There's there's no mm-hmm. hiding the fact that these people need to uh, should be considered more of a threat and uh, more horrific and should be punished more harshly because they have the yeah. goal to not be Australian citizens. Yeah, I actually think yeah. So I I mean the thing about mandatory sentencing just to fin- finish off on that like one of the problems perhaps with communicating why this is problematic is because you get into technical arguments about or legal arguments about separation of powers and that. The, you know, the biggest problem kind of constitutionally with mandatory minimum sentencing is that it does contravene that separation of powers between the courts, the judiciary, and the executive being the administrative government, because it is the government kind of basically going over the top of the court's decisions and saying, and making like imposing a criminal sentence on someone without taking into account all the things that a court does, um, which are kind of, yeah, like a bit of a, a, a technical argument, but it is relevant in this case when we're talking about a court decision that the government is literally trying to overrule. And as you say, it is so clearly motivated by an an, an unequal treatment under the law. And like, I know, you know, I get Queensland, uh, sorry, Australia doesn't have a, a Bill of Rights, but that would be usually included in a human rights charter is the right to equal treatment before the law. And mm. it seems manifestly clear that this is just treating, uh, you know, treating refugees, treating asylum seekers, treating people who are non-citizens completely differently under the criminal law system to Australian citizens for no reason. And there's, you know, there are multiple quotes that I've seen from experts on this, um, but just really Kind of frankly, there was a quote from a spokesperson from the Law Council that said, the Law Council is not aware of evidence demonstrating that a person without citizenship is more likely to re-offend than a person with citizenship. (laughs) Yeah, like obviously, obviously, unless you're just super fucking racist, Um, (laughs) which, you know, yeah, we have a pretty racist government. And, but yes, so like there's that aspect of it and then there is that kind of the problem with um, overruling the judiciary in this way, which is why we've now got a high court challenge already on that basis. So this week we had the news that there's a, a, a Chinese refugee whose lawyers have launched a high court challenge against the imposition of conditions like a curfew and a GPS tracker on him as part of this visa. He was one of the people who was released. Um, they are saying that those things constitute a punishment that they're, they're punitive yeah. And they exceed parliament's authority and they breach the separation of powers. They're saying that these things, like a GPS tracker, are things that are more likely to be or they're usually conditions imposed by a criminal court. So, for example, someone who's out on bail or who's on parole, that's something that the court might impose as a condition. They're not something that an administrative government imposes on an individual. Right. Yeah. Yes, because they're only doing it for 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 blatantly political reasons. Now, everything politicians do is for political reasons, but like clearly just trying to send a signal and to counter this hard right political attack is to sort of say, "Oh, look, oh, we're tough on crime, we're tough on crime," and we're just imposing these yeah. instruments with with no real consideration of the law or community safety or human rights. No, um, it's not. It's, it's not about community safety at all. And you know what? I think. One detail that I had actually missed until today when I was researching this was the fact that the government has confirmed, so Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill has confirmed that the government actually considered releasing this man who was the the plaintiff in the initial high court Mm. case. So, like, arguably I wouldn't be surprised if this is the case with the most serious offending among Mm. this that cohort being, you know, literal child rape. But they considered releasing him with a visa in May this year to prevent losing the high court case because they would rather release that man who is then put up as the example of why we need these harsh laws to protect community safety. They'd rather release him into the community, even though the argument is that he's going to re-offend, than allow for a precedent to be set that would mean that other refugees are released from indefinite detention. What a piece of shit. I said, there's a clip of her too in Parliament looking at Dutton saying you never you never introduce laws as harsh as this, right? Yeah, so they- so again, so this this is their their strategy, and I think this is what is truly 
uh, it shouldn't be surprising, but truly demoralizing about this is like Labor has n- her nothing. The only thing they have in their toolbox when this happens, when Dutton gets up and does his Peter Dutton thing, which he's been doing for a very long time, which is scaremonger, uh, create fear in the community, shit on foreigners, um, you know, uh, stoke racism and xenophobia in our society. The only mm. response Labor seems to have is, no, you're wrong. We're as tough as you. Our dig is yeah. our dick is bigger than yours. It's yeah. pathetic. Yeah. Jesus Christ. And do they really think that they're going to out liberal the liberals? Like, are they going to out Dutton Dutton? I don't understand how they like how they can continue making this strategic bungle of thinking that they can outdo them on issues like this. And yet they continue trying. And they clearly, yes, the objective of all of this is to just override that court decision to keep locking up refugees indefinitely as uh, if possible, but yeah, arbitrarily detaining asylum seekers. And that's kind of, you know, the Greens are arguing, and this is, I guess, this is a legal argument that, that may be had as to whether these laws that impose such strict conditions are effectively detention by another name. That's what Senator Nick McKim was saying this week, that these curfews are effectively house arrest and that the GPS trackers, the ankle bracelets are the kind of electronic surveillance that amounts to electronic detention, um, which would mean that, yeah, it's unconstitutional. They've already served their sentence um, and this is the government just imposing potentially what would amount to detention. I mean, I would argue that, yeah, the stronger argument is that they're effectively making it so hard to comply with those conditions that they're doing everything they can to then just send them back to prison for five years at least. But either way, it's fucked. (laughs) And what is the plan? Are these people supposed to be walking around with ankle bracelets for the rest of their lives? Like what do they, is there any kind of- I guess it is. Yeah. Like if they're overreaching this, is there any prospect of them getting- a permanent visa, like because surely not if they've got these objections against it. So yes. perhaps yes, the rest of their life they can't go the out after li- ten p.m. Yeah. Can't go out before oh. six a.m. Jesus, have to tell the fucking government if you're poor. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Once again, very grateful the Greens exist and are there calling this shit out for what it is. Um, yeah, because again, for for more than twenty years, for well, throughout Australia's history, obviously there's been, been a lot of xenophobia, but particularly I think. The, the the particular version of this in the 21st century post 9/11 and in the world in the war on terror world is just absolutely psychotic behavior and the idea that progressive people can defend labor on this seriously oh and look people in the eyes and pretend as if they give a shit or they're friends of refugees like mm. get the fuck out of here yeah so nick that's right so nick mckim this week announced that he was resigning from his position as was, it, was he chair of Australian Parliamentary Friends of, of Refugees? Um, co-chair, I believe. Co-chair. Uh, and resigned from that over over this, over Labor's, you know, complete capitulation to the LNP, um, their disregard for the human rights of, of refugees and their willingness to just demonise them so quickly uh, mm. to ensure or to do everything they can to to get these people locked back up. We'll see what happens with that High Court challenge. I think it will be interesting. It will also be interesting to see what happens when the full High Court decision is released, again, likely yeah. early next year. And there's also questions about whether the, you know, all of the, the asylum seekers who are affected by the decision could bring a claim for compensation from the government for being unlawfully detained for however many years. I <laughs> That's been raised, so I don't know if, if you know, anyone has um, is looking at that yet, but that may very likely come up. And hey, surprise, surprise, I see in the news this morning as we're recording this, the coalition is trying to whip up scare, uh, a scare campaign around the issues that have, the visas that have been issued to Palestinian people mm. with connections to Australia, yeah. uh, 800 uh, visas handed out to Palestinian refugees. What what do you know? They're raising security concerns because they're going to keep fucking doing this labor and you need to yes. have a better goddamn response. Yes. Grow a heart, grow a spine and stare this racist shit down for what it is. Because you've just shown them that it works. You've just shown it them. It works, totally works. You yes, just immediately follow This is the best way to get to you. They can really get wins. Um, so, of course, they're going to keep doing it and they're going to go harder every time that you capitulate like the fucking spineless cowards that you are. Hmm. <laughs> now to my political panel joining me tonight, Sky News contributor Jenna Tog- Gemma Tognini. I don't understand what parallel universe these people are living in. My views on the Greens are well documented, but today I want to add these people are like, you know, they're drunk on their own, I was going to say, I will say, drunk on their own urine, Shari. These people oh, are. Well, more wonderful news about the state of the world. 
uh, the war on Gaza continues. Although as we're recording this, there is supposed to be a, a four day humanitarian pause slash temporary ceasefire, temporary ceasefire. Uh, to get mm-hmm. some humanitarian aid. There's some hostages being, um, transferred. Apparently, of course, you, you can't negotiate with Hamas. They're evil demons. And then, Hey, what do you know? You can actually negotiate with them, uh, to get back some of the hostages that Hamas took and also to release some of the women and children that have been indefinitely detained mm-hmm. by the Israeli government, which we don't really talk Even about as more, much. It's like, in fact, it's, it's yeah. Good. But yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he's for I think seven thousand political prisoners, I believe, being held by Israel. But but they're the good guys. Um of course, as the war continues, more cook takes about the Greens position, you know, the hey, don't do genocide position we, we crazy radicals get involved with. Shout out to all the school strikes for Palestine this yes. week as well. I thought in Melbourne they were fucking awesome. I thought those kids were great. Every kid I saw in the media was just like clear and unapologetic and really articulate mm. and compassionate. I thought it was it was very cool indeed. The kids are all right. Kids are all right. Did you see this tweet from David Feeney? Um, do you remember no. David Feeney? No, who is that? <laughs> he used to be the member for Batman uh, oh. before it became Cooper. He was the guy yeah. who forgot to declare that house that he extra house that he had that was oh. being negatively geared. Right. And he's also the guy who left his talking points in the studio at Sky News. <laughs> oh, love that. Okay, what's he saying? <sighs> He's a man of the people, this guy. His Twitter handle is still Feeny for Batman, which I still find funny. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, people laid out, you know, did that process at Peter Khalil's, the Labor MP for Wills' office, like, you know, fake fake bodies out to the yes. front of his office and saying you're complicit in genocide because yeah. like, oh, no, oh. And in a Twitter thread on that, David Feeney said, the point is the Greens Party, oh, oh and sorry, the, the question was like, why are they targeting Wills? And the oh, suggestion okay. from Cosmaris as well. This is where the Greens are a threat, and so they're organising around this. Um, okay. You know, I'm sure lots of people, including the Greens, but generally good pe- people of good conscience, are looking at what's happening and saying, "Hey, our Labor, go- Labor government should be doing more on this and sh- mm-hmm. should actually commit to a ceasefire." But according to political genius David Feeney, the point <laughs> is that the Greens political party are weaponising the Arab-Israeli conflict in those parts of metropolitan Melbourne where they hope a woke plus Islamist bloc might deliver them electoral victory. Their wow. support for Hamas is built on a perceived electoral advantage, hashtag Hamas ISIS. The collab we've all been waiting for, the woke plus Islamist bloc. <laughs> Damn, name a more iconic duo. <laughs> this fucking weaponizing the Arab-Israeli conflict, so doing anything about oh my God, saying yeah. anything, taking any position, taking yeah, any direct action it. about the biggest news story in the world, which is a genocide taking place in real time with the complicit support of our government, saying anything <laughs> about organizing around that, doing anything and putting any political pressure on our elected representatives about that, of course, is weaponizing this terrible conflict. Because that's how these people see it. They literally Jesus. cannot see anything other than through the lens of like electoral gain or loss. Don't, yes, 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 a genocide is happening, but please don't be mean to your local Labor representative. No. Why would you do that? They've got to concentrate. They're working on laws to lock up refugees in those offices. You let them a little mm, bit of quiet. They're please. busy. <laughs> uh, but my favourite was this piece. Again, we were going to talk about this in the live show, but we ran out of time. But um, I just think it's really challenging and important and worthy of okay. our time. Wow, okay. This appeared in the Australian newspaper. Headline, the Greens are, by sins of omission, soft apologists for Hamas. Oh, oh no. by sins of omission. Interesting. Go on. It's by Gemma Tanini. Do we know Gemma Tanini? I don't. No. She's the executive director of at GT Communications, business owner, consultant, public speaking, public speaker, and social commentator. Oh, goody, goody. <laughs> <laughs> None of those are real jobs, by the way. No. This is um. <laughs> says the comedian. Says the, says to the, the staffer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, this is her bio. Gemma's journey from television journalist and chief of staff to award-winning business owner and entrepreneur has not been typical by any means. Oh, after <laughs> no, go on. After a decade with the Seven Network, she walked away from a high-profile career to start GT Media with nothing wow. more than a vision, a mobile, and contact book. And how many dollars? She and her team were soon consulting to banks, breweries, and everything in between, helping these companies build, grow, and protect their external and internal reputations. (laughs) I hate. I hate this kind of talk. I I can't stand it. I can't stand listening to this. 
But I just like how it's like, okay, she, she worked in the Seven Network, then she left and started a media company. That's what Not you need to say. Not typical by any means. That's what you need to say. Yeah. She's and re- you've really broken the mold there, Gemma. Really, no one else has ever done that yeah, before. No, you are. You're unique, Gemma. You're so special. <laughs> So she, uh, she's, yeah, she writes, she's a columnist. She just has opinions. That's her full-time job, it seems. And I assume her media company Again, probably helps Tom. banks cover up their crimes. Um, has opinions. But, that's their full-time job, Tom. Uh, yes, but when I do it, it's cute and charming. Okay. Keep going. All right. Fucking hell. Whose side are you on? <laughs> um, she pops up on Sky News all the time, obviously hates the Greens, but I think there's a lot going on in this piece that we should interrogate. Okay. It's been a wild old time in Australian politics. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more off-piste, we find ourselves in a weird kind of parallel universe in which the Australian Greens want to help run the country? What? The Greens, regardless of what you thought of them back in the day, once stood for something meaningful under former leader Bob Brown. Mm, Okay, go on. So then she links to her own article, another opinion piece she wrote under under former leader Bob Brown. That's a link to her own article, Bob Brown, The Environment Needs You. This is a piece that she wrote oh, a while ago. Oh, yeah. I remember this, I think. You remember this? She was, getting, she was saying, hey, Bob Brown, you love the environment. We've got to get you back in to campaign against the environmental impact of wind, wind farms. Yeah. Because wind yeah, farms are killing everyone. Yeah. Yes. Very strange. More recently, though, they've morphed into this country's most ungrateful, juvenile, destructive, and mean spirited group of underachievers. Yet somehow they think they should be in the starting lineup. You can argue the ALP already is dancing with this particular devil, but a couple of weeks ago, news broke that the Greens want Anthony Albanese to sign a public power sharing deal with them and offer cabinet positions in the event of a minority government at the next election. Says who? Says Shane Rattenbury, the leader of the ACT oh, Greens. Okay, well, maybe he should <laughs> stick to the ACT. No offense, Shane, but. <laughs> well, this was a piece, again, I was g- going to f- consider talking about this on the show too, but we, yeah, lots of other stuff was happening. But this was a this is a story in the Australian. It didn't appear anywhere else, and it just had the headline, Greens radical pitch to Anthony Albanese, share power with us. And it was billed as this exclusive, incredible insight that the Australians had this radical proposal. And all it was was him saying he'd be delighted if the <laughs> Greens were to enter into a power sharing agreement if there's a minority government at the next election. Breaking. Of course he would. <laughs> what do you mean? This is a man in a power sharing arrangement with a Labor government. That's a, yes, he's, yes, they've been there for ages at the ACT. Of course he wants that. But it's, I guess, just the Australian gearing up the whole. Labor Greens Alliance stuff already. Like we're not even anywhere near the election and we're still already trying to terrify people about that. Okay. Yep. Can you imagine the likes of Lydia Thorpe? Yes, she's no longer a Green, but she was. (laughs) And Maureen Faruqi in the federal cabinet. Oh, not brown women. Oh, yuck. (laughs) The idea should fill all sensible folk with a sense of impending doom. Why they chose those two. (laughs) Weird, isn't it? Keep going. ACT Greens leader and Attorney General Shane Rattenbury is the party's most senior MP. He argues that federal Labor will do better by welcoming the Greens with open arms formally. And while they're at it, they may as well throw in a few lazy cabinet roles as well. When they say most senior Greens, so they just mean the Greens MP who has been elected the longest in the country? No, well, I guess you would say technically because he holds a cabinet position in oh, the ACT. Interesting. Interesting take. In the the yeah. ACT though, but yeah, I okay, recently read on. it. I thought you mean he's the oldest one. <laughs> like he's, yeah, yeah. There's a like, lot of okay, sure. Seniors. I don't even know how old he is, and I think the other people would be older than him. Anyway, I think she means because he is the Attorney General of the ACT, he has okay. a cabinet role. Sure. Then and sure. is the leader. Yeah. Some of you will dismiss this as pie in the sky kind of deal. I can almost hear some of you saying, "Yeah, it will never happen. It's just politics, just part of the game." Wow, she gets me. What? She knows what, exactly what I'm going to say. Maybe some of you also thought there'd never again be a time when Jewish Australians didn't feel safe in their own neighbourhoods. Got Whoa. you there, Emma. <laughs> er, you change, okay? <laughs> okay. Go on. Jewish people being persecuted on the streets and the Greens want to be in power. What has happened to this world? Also, okay, doesn't she know there are like there have been very active Nazis, particularly in Melbourne, for like quite some time? Mm. But the, Jew- the the Greens ones are worse. Oh, okay, sure. Life moves pretty fast, so the saying goes. Back to the Greens, the elite of the mediocre, which again <laughs> makes you no it. sense. If you're yeah. elite, even within the mediocre, you're automatically not mediocre anymore, so that doesn't make sense. Perhaps let's judge them for a moment on what they've delivered in terms of value to the Australian people. You know, those of us who pay their wages. 
Nothing, not a thing. You see, oh, they can afford they're not to, in government the absolutists. They, the they have the okay, luxury of being sure. able to be as hard wired and hard left as they like. This classic girl, oh, there's no accountability, yada, yada, yada. Interesting. Yeah, except that you've just referenced the fact that Shane Rattenbury is the Attorney General of the ACT um, and they're actually in a power sharing arrangement there. So they sort of are part of the ACT government, had been there for quite a long time, been returned by the people of the ACT. So that's just one example, plus no acknowledgement, of course, of the. No, but Tom. They've delivered nothing. Anyway, here's why absolutism is bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care about nuance, these evil Satanist cunts. This week's walk out of the federal parliament in protest against the government's position on Israel is a powerful, powerful. validation of this yeah. view. <laughs> Her view. Oh, so powerful. Her own view. <laughs> yeah, I have this view mm. and I've just been I powerfully believe. validated. Yeah. I'm, I'm awesome. I'm going to take this analysis skills to my work with banks and breweries. Like a bunch of petulant four-year-olds, the Greens stormed out of the chamber, all bluster, piss and wind, because they want an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and they can't get what they want. We didn't even get it. Yeah, that's why. We were just like, give us what we want. Hmm. Meh. Apart from the fact the collective IQ of the federal parliament immediately and exponentially increased. Oh, oh, what? Okay, collective? Do you mean like average? I guess anyway. the whole thing went up, yeah. I mean, Pauline Hanson's and Malcolm Roberts are still in there, of course, but it's a shame we couldn't just lock the door behind them and be done with it. It's a shame we live in a democracy, isn't it, oh, where true. people get to elect their representatives that sort of reflect their views. It's annoying we can't just get rid of all the reviews that I don't like, that I, Gemma Tanini, think is, is silly. It is annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. This is great. Walking out delivers nothing, adds nothing, brings nothing proves only that those who take their metaphorical toys and leave aren't capable of the debate of ideas. <laughs> Couldn't the Greens have just stayed there and we could have had a frank exchange in the marketplace right. of ideas that the, the Senate is renowned for, by the way, of people changing their yeah, minds, yeah. listening to evidence. Always freely allowed yeah, freely allowed debate, yeah. Yeah, and even though, again, the calls for ceasefire were in line with uh, Amnesty International, the United Nations, the Australian public, mm-hmm. the British public, the American mm-hmm. public. No, no, they mm-hmm. need to stay in this room and convince these other bloodthirsty psychopaths surrounding them who are completely in hock to the US uh, foreign policy and won't do anything to contradict it at all that what they're doing is wrong. Why couldn't they do that? On this issue, the Greens are, by sins of omission, soft apologists for Hamas. They have nothing meaningful to say about the confirmed testimony and evidence of the massacres of women being raped, mutilated and shot, parents being mutilated while still alive in front of their children, the absolutely unthinkable, inhuman barbarism perpetrated by Hamas. Grudgingly, they say, well, look, it's wrong, but occupation. Literally, okay, but begrudgingly, begrudgingly you guys say, well, look, it's wrong that Israel is bombing hospitals, but not even kind of, oh, it could possibly, maybe they should consider not doing that when yeah. confronted with, you know, evidence of the f- fucking war crimes that they're committing. Like, what are you talking about? It's also completely untrue. I mean, every Greens MP so, condemned yes, the Hamas they attacks absolutely condemned immediately. Hamas. Yeah. And like, again, going when whenever you go into details about the horrific atrocities perpetrated by Hamas on October the 7th, I'm so, the, the only way I can take you seriously if you apply a similar level of condemnation and horror at, at what is yeah. happening to Palestinian people on on yeah. such a greater scale, like thousands of like thousands of kids being killed. Yeah, and you just got to shrug that off as like a cost of what? Mm. What the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got this uh, classic. Oh, why didn't they walk out on other stuff? Uh, spare me the hypocrisy. Did they walk out of Parliament when thousands of Palestinians were slaughtered by the Syrian regime in 2020? <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense. Of course not, because the Assad regime is not an easy target for the ideologically obsessed. Oh yeah, the Greens love the Assad regime. Like <laughs> big fans. Yeah. I tell you what, send the parliamentary Greens to Gaza and give them a real chance to live their truth. Really I, normal. I yeah. love that phrase too because it's like, oh, send them to Gaza where they'll be killed by an Israeli yeah. airstrike? Right, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like it's bad. That is the classic. I don't know if you've seen like all the fucking clips of Zionists being like, oh, if you love Palestine so much, why don't you go live in, in Gaza? Why don't you go live there? It's like because they are under siege <laughs> from Israel, which is yes. why we're protesting. <laughs> like what? Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Smart people. The deeper issue here is, of course, the dilemma for the Albanese government. It is a friendly bedfellow with the Greens. What? Perhaps not yet sharing a <laughs> maritable bed, more like bunking in together. Shared room, shared bathroom, twin share type situation. What? Guys, we've got to meet these word counts. We've got to, <laughs> <laughs> we have got to flesh this piece out. Just incomprehensible. 
people don't get this analogy, so I need to just describe the room, the metaphorical room yeah. that the labor and the greens are living in. Yeah, not a twin. Yeah, not re- not red curtains, but brown. Not a double bed, but it's actually <laughs> twin beds next to each other, and the ceilings are regulation three meters high. Just seven hundred bucks a week. You're getting me now? Because we refuse to yeah. put any uh, rental caps on. <laughs> <laughs> Labor can protest as much as it likes, but in the pitch battle between the perception and reality, we know who the winner will be, and for the federal government, that's a problem. In issues beyond Israel's sovereignty and its right to defend itself, the problem of the federal government is closer to home. The Greens' stated policy position reads like a celebration of victimhood for all, wrapped in delusion, fit for a university Trotsky club. I urge you to invest the 15 minutes it takes to read it all. It's terrifying and it's like, mm. I haven't done that. It's terrifying and it's lack of sophistication. <laughs> Everybody wins everything all the time. Why are you against that, Gemma? You don't oh, want everyone that to win. Really good. <laughs> sounds good. Everyone wins. Damn, that's awesome. <sighs> Crazy. How'd they figure that out? The Greens and the ACT, where Rattenby reigns, want children as young as fourteen to have access to euthanasia. Now, look, I don't know what she's fucking referring I to. Haven't there even. At, I'm not sure all, what that's what about. Talking about almost certainly a misrepresentation. They boasted about yeah. quietly decriminalizing drugs such as MDMA, cocaine, and ice. A really good thing. Did they boast about it, or did they quietly do it? <laughs> Pick one, babe. Pick one. They boasted about quietly. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> quietly decriminalized. Which is it? <laughs> Got to fill that work out. They are, by yeah. every metric and manageable, out of step with sensible people of all backgrounds, creeds, and color. Except for a ceasefire, Gemma, which the majority of Australians agree with, you fucking yeah. moron. Yeah, you are the one who is out of step. You're so crazy. Go on. They wrap themselves in words such as diversity, yet tolerate no divergent view. I love that too. It's like... They're a political party. We agree about certain ideas. We fight for those ideas. What are you talking about? Yeah. You should have, what, conservatives in there too? <laughs> they talk about ending violence against women, but have nothing to say about the rape and mutilation of Jewish women in this pogrom. Jesus Christ. Wrong. Incorrect. Incorrect as well. Fake. The Prime Minister, yeah. best be careful. As my non opina used to say, Gemma, you lie down with dogs, you start to bark. That's not, that's not, what? Isn't it you're going to catch fleas? Yeah, I haven't heard that one either. I guess that's. That's not a maybe it's an Italian thing. Not a penis Sorry. little twist. Don't want to upset the Italians. This is the time. Not Francesca Albanese. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. This is the time for clear, strong, and forthright leadership. Not the time for entertaining follies such as this. The government has a choice to make about who- follies such as what? Does she mean follies such as a ceasefire, or does she mean follies such as a power sharing arrangement? I guess so, or just the existence of the Greens in any way whatsoever. Oh, okay. This government has a choice to make about who it aligns with. For a party that's defined by the phrase, whatever it takes, this will be a telling period indeed, which again makes no sense. If you are a party that believes in whatever it takes and you are put into a minority position and your only option to form government would be to form a minority relationship with the Greens and you actually refuse that offer of whatever it takes to hang on to power, then you mm. wouldn't be a whatever it takes party anyway. Whatever it takes. I also, what is Labor's yeah. other option in that particular circumstance is to yeah. have another an election? Do you really think that should happen? Or they should <laughs> d- line up, like form a coalition with matter, the coalition, Tom. which we've discussed She's before. clicked submit, yes. the article's getting printed, she's sitting back, she gets paid. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Thanks, Gemma. Love you. Thanks, Gemma. You know, they're drunk on their own. Drunk on their own urine, sorry. As this episode comes out, rising tide in Newcastle will already have been underway, blockading the world's largest coal port, a bunch of civil disobedience actions for climate change. It is sometimes easy to, not, not it's not easy to forget, but it's like hard to focus on an attempted genocide and fucking climate collapse at the same time potentially. Yeah. So big solidarity to everyone who is down in Newcastle at the moment um, fighting for action on that you can support the blockade and i wouldn't be surprised if there are you know some some legal costs and things like that that um need support after this weekend at risingtide.org.au forward slash blockade we'll put the link in the show notes yes i believe tim hollow former serious danger guest is going to be out there like they're mm-hmm. getting on kayaks actually going out as a flotilla blockade on right. the water i believe yeah. adam band is also is has been trying to learn how to I to think so. paddle a kayak. I don't know if you could do that, but I think What it's do good. you mean learn? I think it's pretty simple. You just pick up the paddles and you go. <laughs> if you haven't done it before, it can be quite awkward. Sure. Um, yeah, it's great stuff. I mean, you know, talk about 1,500 people or something like getting out there. The idea, mm. of course, that they can't arrest all of them. And, yes, a very worthy cause. Good work, y'all. And I guess just in the in the context of, yeah, the continued crackdown on mm. peaceful and, and, you know, and disruptive protest just this week, I believe it was, that there was the um, protest at the port where 
uh, an exporter of arms to Israel uh, was targeted by activists, blockaded by activists, and police stormed in, I think, even on horses mm. and in such a you know dangerous and violent way that there's that footage of the crowd literally having to like crowd surf a fucking child in a pram out of it. And what I thought was so fucking disgraceful was the ABC reporting on this and just saying there is like there was this big protest, there is footage of a pram being hoisted up above the crowd by protesters. No context right. as to why that might be. Just be like, these crazy fucking violent protesters, fuck you, ABC. Um, anyway. Emerald's views do not reflect everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, Tune in to question everything in coming weeks on ABC One. <laughs> God damn it. Fucking shill. Um, a lot of those protesters were charged. New South Wales has these fucked anti-protest laws. Uh, the right to protest is under attack. The Human Rights Law Center and the Australian Democracy Network have written a declaration of our right to protest. You can read and support that at australiandemocracy.org.au forward slash protest dash rights slash dats dash declaration, whatever. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> um, yeah. We're going to leave you uh, this week. Thanks for listening as always. Thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for celebrating and, and joining us last week too and getting us through 100 Yay. episodes for God's sakes. Uh, we're going to go out with a, uh, a little something that our wonderful producer, Michael the Griff Griffin, has put together. As you know, he was personally affected by and a strong advocate for the rights of people who were the victims of the horrific shit show that was RoboDebt. This week, our wonderful Labor government, again, who are just the good guys and it's so great that the old guys are mm. gone. Had a little announcement about how many recommendations from the Royal Commission to RoboDebt they were going to be accepting. They they said the wrong number because they're cunts and they're trying to get away with, again, more gaslighting and lying to people and trying to avoid the full recommendations of that report. So enjoy that. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye. Rick, we're talking about this 57th recommendation of the RoboDebt Royal Commission. I, I feel like I'm losing my mind on this one. The point was that they had accepted all 56 recommendations. The Commission, as you know, handed down 56 recommendations. The government has accepted all 56 of the recommendations. Catherine Holmes made 57 recommendations. It's right there in the report, in black and white. If you go back to the day the report was released, you've got Bill Shorten standing up on July 7. There's a lot to read. There's a lot to... T 57 recommendations. I managed to speak to a Labor staffer who agreed to talk only on the condition of anonymity. And they said to me, we knew there were 57 recommendations. And we knew we weren't going to touch that one. And they said, I don't know who made the call, but suddenly 57 became 56 and we wanted a clean 56. The man who is in charge of making sure it is never repeated. The man, in fact, who spent a long time uh, making the case that robo-debt was a terrible, terrible idea, a terrible scheme, is the now Government Services Minister, Bill Shorten. I feel at long last that a nation who'd been gaslighted by the previous government who said that they did nothing different to what previous governments had done and there was nothing wrong with this. I feel their vindication because clearly this gov the old government was lying, lying, lying. And I know people think all politicians lie, but I'm sorry, this was a government, they're the most powerful people in Australia, the Commonwealth of Australia, it is the biggest deal. This is something which this government, the previous government hid from, they denied it. This is a complete illustration of venality, incompetence and cowardice. Is it to you the greater crime, the, oh, the, the cover-up, essentially, the, the continuation? It was an abuse of power, but then it was the unwillingness to hear the bad news. I heard the Prime Minister at the media conference you were at earlier today saying, oh, it's, we have a different relationship, we, there's a different culture now. The culture's different now. The Commission, as you know, handed down 56 recommendations. Slightly dangerous to Australia.